of introducing our next speaker. And if you think things are complicated, Natanya is going to make them even more complicated than that. Natanya Sandler Utai is our speaker. She comes to us from the University of Texas Galveston. She trained with Danny Dueck at the uh, at uh, NIH, and despite that, she got a really good job. And so she's gonna, <laughs> she's gonna, <laughs> her title of her talk, talk is A Silver Lining in Every Cloud, The Two Sides of Interferon. Thank you, Michael. I would have to say because of it, not in spite of it. Um, so in any case, uh, Michael mentioned um, my topic, and I want to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk about the very confusing story of interferon. So first, the cloud. And by the way, this picture, I think, was part of the reason that it took me so long to upload these slides. But this is a cloud <laughs> taken outside uh, my house yesterday. But um, the cloud is really the question, how could type 1 interferons actually accelerate disease progression? And there are a number of ways. And, and really, a couple of stories, uh, a couple of studies that were published six or so years ago show illustrated why we might think that type 1 interferons may accelerate progression. And this is from Steve Bosinger, but there is also a, a paper by Beatrice Jacqueline showing that in uh, rhesus macaques, who are the pathogenic host, when infected with SIV MAC239, for example, they progress to AIDS. Um, these animals will upregulate type 1 interferons. Actually, you can't see my, my pointer here. These animals will upregulate type 1 interferon um, and interferon stimulated genes, as listed here, during acute infection at day 14. The sim same thing happens in the Sudimanga bees, which are non pathogenic hosts. These are animals that are able to coexist with SIV and not progress to AIDS. But when you look in chronic infection, the animals that uh, the rhesus macaques who progress to AIDS maintain upregulated interferon-stimulated genes, whereas the Sudimanga bees who do not progress to AIDS downregulate their interferon-stimulated genes. Thus, it suggests that interferon signaling normalizes in chronic non-pathogenic infe infection and that this persistent interferon signal uh, signaling in pathogenic infection may be contributing to uh, progression to AIDS. So how might this happen? Well, there are a number of possible mechanisms. One is through, one is through CD4 T cell recruitment. So it has been shown that as early as one day after inoculation, uh, plasmacytoid dendritic cells collect in the endocervical submucosa. And here they can produce type 1 interferons. Well, in addition, they also produce CCR5 ligands, and the type 1 interferons induce CCR5 expression on CD4 T cells. So together, this results in increased recruitment of CD4 T cells to the site of inoculation. There's also a matter, and I, I didn't show the data here, but there's also a matter that type 1 interferons can increase a CD4 T cell apoptosis. So you get simultaneously the recruitment of CD4 T cells and increased loss. So then there was a, a couple of very elegant studies of the LCMV infection in mice published a couple of years ago showing that, LC that uh, interferon signaling may actually be detrimental towards adaptive immune responses. And in the figure on the left, you can see the number of cytokine-producing antigen-specific CD4 T cells. And in animals that had, that received the antibody to the interferon receptor indicated in red, these animals had significantly higher numbers of cytokine producing cells, whether interferon gamma or interferon gamma TNF and IL-2, compared to the placebo treated animals. And this actually translated to the interferon treated animal, interferon uh, antibody, receptor antibody treated animals having sooner viral clearance compared to the placebo animals suggesting that interferon signaling can actually decrease the number of cytokine-producing cells and, um, and delay LCMV clearance. In addition to dampening the CD4 responses, CD8 responses actually have somewhat of an opposite reaction to type 1 interferons. And in the study of, uh, from, of PBMCs from LCMVFECT, LCMV-infected mice, comparing um, wild-type mice to perforin-deficient mice and wild-type mice with interferon and uh, receptor-deficient mice, 
They found in a co-culture experiment of wild-type NK cells and wild-type T cells from these infected animals was a persistence of CD8 T cells. And the number remained the same no matter how many NK cells were added to the CD8 T cell co-culture. However, if they incubated the interferon receptor uh, deficient mice with um, uh, CD8 T cells from the interferon receptor deficient mice with NK cells, they saw a dramatic decline in CD8 T cells, suggesting that it was specifically interferon that was mediating the survival of CD8 cells in the presence of NK cells. And they showed using perforin, uh, producing our perforin deficient NK cells, that this was a perforin mediated process. So uh, Michael Letterman, I think, was, uh, was a, uh, one of the senior authors on this paper. The, I, it was a study of pegylated interferon given to patients with HIV infection, not on antiretroviral therapy. And what the study showed was that with, uh, with interferon treatment from week zero to week three to week 12 of treatment, there's a gradual increase in the frequency of activated CD8 T cells and that this activation actually seemed to persist even after stopping interferon treatment, suggesting that type 1 interferons can also increase CD8 T cell activation. And some, some really interesting data on the role of type 1 interferons and gut damage have uh, come about in the last five or six years or so, and we've heard a lot about microbial translocation already today. But in the study of mice, TNF administration to mice to induce gut damage, we see on the left, wild-type mice have destruction of villi, this is from the ileum, destruction of the villi and a lot of cell loss, goblet cell loss, a lot of apoptosis, whereas interferon receptor deficient mice had preservation of the villi, suggesting that TNF induced gut damage, which is one of the possible mechanisms of gut damage in HIV infection, may actually be mediated to some extent by interferon signaling. And concomitant with that, in a study of patients with hepatitis B inf uh, virus infection who are on stable lamivudine treatment, the addition of type 1 interferon to their treatment regimen actually resulted in increase in soluble CD14, which could be a marker of monocyte activation and, and putatively LPS-induced monocyte activation. So with all of this, with the idea that type 1 interferons increase CD4 recruitment, may increase CD4 apoptosis, increase CD8 persistence, increase CD8 activation, increase gut damage, um, how could they possibly slow disease progression? And here I'm going to be a little bit of a devil's advocate. By the way, that was also the cloud. That was the rest of the cloud from outside my house. So uh, this is uh, some data I will actually be presenting in more detail tomorrow evening at the Interferon Symposium. But this was a study I did in Danny Duick's lab in which we gave uh, um, pegylated interferon to rhesus macaques prior to high-dose rectal challenge. We, start, we started the interferon dosing one week um, prior to challenge. And what we saw was the placebo-treated animals all were infected within with one challenge, whereas the animals that received interferon alpha actually required many more challenges, up to five challenges, to become infected, suggesting that interferon administration actually delayed SIV acquisition. In a parallel study, we also gave an interferon receptor antagonist. So this is a, a molecule that was very much like native interferon, but mutated to bind the re receptor more strongly and abrogates signaling. We gave this an antagonist to rhesus macaques during just the first four weeks of SIV infection, or placebo. And you can see that the antagonist-treated animals had higher viral loads throughout chronic infection, even though they were no longer on um, receptor blockade. Similarly, in the lymph node, we saw that the interferon receptor antagonist treated animals had higher SIV RNA levels. So interferon signaling blockade during acute SIV infection actually resulted in higher SIV burden in chronic infection. But ultimately, what we care about is clinical outcome. Virus is one thing, but what actually happens to the patients or the monkeys is another. And we found that the 
Placebo-treated animals lived a long, healthy life, moved on to do other things, whereas the antagonist-treated animals started dying precipitously at week 24 from AIDS-related events and subsequently had to be euthanized um, for humanitarian reasons. So ultimately, interference signaling blockade bl uh, during acute SIV accelerated progression to death. So how might this be happening? Well, one may one main reason may be through control of HIV replication. The uh, um, type 1 interferon induces restriction factors that can happen at virtually every phase of the SI, uh, HIV or SIV life cycle, starting from viral entry with TRIM5 uh, interfering with capsid uncoding, APOBEC3G and SAMHD1 interfering with reverse transcription, MIX2 uh, interfering with nuclear entry by destabilizing the nuclear uh, DNA, uh, Schlafen 11, which can actually use the uh, transfer uh, RNA and prevent uh, viral assembly, and subsequently tethering, which can prevent the budding of the virus. So type 1 interferon can induce the expression of all of these restriction factors that may facilitate virus control. In addition, type 1 interferons activate NK cells, and it can actually do this in two mechanisms, one by binding the interferon receptor on NK cells and another by inducing dendritic cells to produce IL-15, which will then uh, transpresent through the IL-15 receptor. Regardless, these activated NK cells actually uh, then go on to produce not only cytokines such as interferon gamma, but also perforin and granzyme. And in contrast to the effects on CD4 T cells, in this LCMV model, actually the interferon receptor antibody treated uh, mice had lower CD8 T cell responses, uh, suggesting that whereas interferon signaling, signaling may hamper CD4 responses, it may augment CD8 responses. And lastly, in this review article from uh, that Steve Bosinger and I wrote, we, we went through a lot of the studies that have been done, and there are many, many studies of type 1 interference in both untreated and treated HIV infection. And uh, you can reference these articles, this article, if you want to uh, read more um, about these studies. But I do want to highlight essentially that in untreated and patients not on antiretroviral therapy, interference tended to decrease HIV burden and tended actually to increase the CD4 to CD8 ratio and slow disease progression. However, if you think, however, if you think about this um, with heart, we also saw in, in, in uh, suboptimal ART regimens perhaps a greater decrease in HIV D RNA and less RNA rebound and treatment and eruption studies, as well as a uh, uh, but in contrast, we saw a decrease in CD4 recovery. And it's interesting when going back to think about the patients who are not on antiretroviral therapy who received type 1 interferon, the results really pale in comparison to combination antiretroviral therapy. So the pros of type 1 interferon is that it can, they can protect against infection, induce restriction factors, induce CD, NK cell cytotoxicity, and facilitate CD8 T cell functionality. But the cons are their role in CD4 recruitment, loss of CD4 T cell function, CD8 activation, CD8 longevity, and increased gut damage. And ultimately, thus far, what the studies have shown is that maybe HIV control may be more important than immune activation with regards to the benefits and consequences of interferons. So to summarize, type 1 interferons are necessary for survival in acute, untreated retrovirus infection, and interferons may increase HIV control with absent or insufficient antiretroviral therapy. But really, there haven't been any good, thorough, long-term studies of interferon um, published yet in chronic suppressed SIV or HIV infection to show whether it's beneficial or harmful. And with that, I'll leave my acknowledgments, and I'm happy to answer questions. And I think we can open up to questions from the audience. And while people are walking up, maybe I can, can start. Mm -hmm. um, so you've told us the good, and you've told us the bad. Mm -hmm. And you've suggested that the good is in HIV disease is, li is likely a consequence of induction of viral restriction. Mm -hmm. So can you look at, are there pathways that are induced by type 1 interferons? Mm 
um, that are independent of activation of these restriction factors, but that may be mediating some of the, the, the bad things. And I know that you've done a fairly detailed analysis of the transcriptome of these uh, rhesus. Uh, can you tell us anything about possible targets that we might be able to target while uh, the good things in interferon are, are, are allowed to, to, to happen? Right. Well, there are, um, there are 10,000 or so some on genes in that database. Um, but I will say, you know, some of, the, some of the more interesting factors, I think, looking at the gut, and I know we're already talking a lot about the gut, but certainly the gut is somewhat of a bystander in this issue, um, and that may be a place to target. Um, IDO is um, actually indolamine with IDO, indolamine deoxygenase for chimera and tryptophan levels is actually very strongly induced by type 1 interferons. That might be a pathway to target. Um, and, you know, in general, it, it can activate monocytes, and um, I think that monocyte activation in general is probably the mediator of a lot of the non-AIDS events that we're seeing, and that going just one step downstream of type 1 interferons to target the monocyte activation may be a way to go. Great. Thanks. Luis? Yes, thank you for a wonderful summary of a very complex uh, topic. Um, just a plug for tomorrow night, 6.30, the ANRS is having a workshop on interferon uh, with multiple sources, multiple groups here at the Think Group, uh, room 110. So I encourage you to attend that. But my question is in relation to you know the six macaques that were treated during acute infection, I just want to highlight that perhaps we're going to discuss that tomorrow as well, but yes. there's a big difference with antiretroviral therapy and interferon than there is without it. Because, you know, we've been treating or at least experiencing treatment of now upwards of 37 people with 20 weeks of interferon. And the experience from that human intervention is not necessarily the same as a non-human primate. Sure. That's not to say that the two are not telling us something important because I think interferon in the context of viremia and TLR activation may be quite different than it is in the context of immune reconstitution, just like CD8 T cell responses with energy versus non-energy in the context of T cell uh, antiretroviral therapy. So I think that the, the challenge is to sort of restrict the conclusions relative to the role of interferon to a specific instance in a specific circumstance of disease and perhaps even staging of disease and not necessarily to over uh, ex, you know, expect that the heterogeneity of this could be captured in, in, in one particular angle, which is what, what, you, what you said, but I'm just saying that the, the complexity of it goes even beyond what we were able to review today. Yeah, and I think, it, you know, you bring up the important point that I, I like to think of HIV as really three different diseases now, acute infection, chronic untreated infection, and chronic Vi virologically suppressed infection, and the three are very different, look different immunologically, and look different with regards to progression. Ed? Ed? Um, uh, yes, I, I'd like to, to recall uh, Dominique Emily's study on interferon treatment. Um, during primary infection, interferon treatment was given during art interruptions and this um, induced only um, delay in HIV viral load rebound. Uh, this was interesting uh, because there was a two-week delay. It wasn't much. And also there was uh, an adjuvant effect on uh, antibody responses, specific HIV antibody responses, which was recalling previous studies in mice showing that interferon was an excellent adjuvant for vaccination and also from cross-presentation from uh, Bellardelli's uh, work and uh, Le Bon and Toff's work. Um, but I think that the study uh, Louis Montagnier alluded to that was given at the same time as art um, may be much more effective and uh, may uh, follow up on your observation that uh, interferon is important in viral uh, suppression. Right, and the, um, you know, to, com to comment on that, the, 
you know, I, I like the idea of the combination with antiretroviral therapy because the antiretroviral therapy really only targets the virus, whereas the interferon targets the. Okay, one last question, and you made the point at the end, which was that uh, in treated infection, nobody has tested the utility of interferon administration or interferon blockade for HIV events. So which would you do first? I, I guess it would, it would depend on my endpoint, uh, but if I were trying to affect immune activation as in this, I would probably use the antagonist. And, you know, if I were trying to see if I could just shrink that reservoir a little bit more and use interferon, I think ultimately, though, I'm not sure that in and of itself that that's really enough by the time someone has progressed to chronic infection. Great. Well, thanks, Natanya. That was great.